<clears throat> All right, let's continue on with serial killers. So um, we previously covered the power-oriented type, um, psychological type of killers. Now let's move on to what is called mission-oriented. And a mission-oriented serial killer, um, which, you know, while still having, um, obviously, some of the characteristics of power-oriented, truly believes that he is doing the world a favor. And so the best example of this is Gary Ridgway, who was the Green River Killer in uh, the Seattle area. He was eventually convicted of killing 48 prostitutes in Seattle. And what makes him mission-oriented is during his interrogations, um, he honestly couldn't believe that he was being arrested. Um, in his mind, he should have been given a medal because he was ridding the world of prostitutes. So um, he was actually doing a good thing in his mind, okay? So that was his motivation. <coughs> Another interesting thing about Gary Ridgway, first of all, happily married. Um, and, you know, I used to think, how could you, you know, how could a wife live with a husband and not have any idea he's a serial killer? Um, I, I actually truly believe now, knowing what I know, that that's possible because these people are so good at compartmentalizing themselves. I mean, we all have a dark side, right? Um, but their dark side is so incredibly dark and they are very, very good at keeping it hidden to everyone except those, um, you know, who they want to show it to. So yeah, I actually do think that's completely possible. Um, the other interesting thing about him is he um, passed a polygraph with flying colors. Um, he was actually interviewed pretty early on in the investigation, and it wasn't until the DNA backlog caught up um, that a match to him was determined. So remember, um, if he is, you know, a, a psychopath, which obviously he clearly is, um, there's no conscience. So there's nothing to feel guilty about. And especially with him, if he thought he was doing, you know, the world a favor, you know, what's the big deal? Yeah, I, I'm going to lie, but, you know, it doesn't bother me. I don't have a conscience. So uh, it makes sense that he, you know, was able to clearly pass a polygraph. Okay, visionary. Um, best example of a visionary serial killer would be David Berkowitz, who was known as the son of Sam. Um, and this... Um, in this category, it would be killers who kill because they are directed by hallucinations or, you know, whether they be auditory or visual. So Sam was actually the neighbor's black lab, which is shown in the, the photograph to the right. And supposedly that black lab was telling David Berkowitz, um, you know, he needed to go out and kill um, couples, you know, as they were sitting in their cars, um, usually at lover's lanes. Now, um, I think a lot of people, um, you know, will call BS on this because David Berkowitz started out um, setting fires. You know, he set, you know, many, many fires. And when he wasn't getting enough attention, that's when he switched to homicide. So, um, you know, did he make up the story? It could be. I mean, he was able to fool some mental health professionals along with this, but... Um, you know, was he power oriented, you know, or was he truly visionary? Um, kind of the jury's out on that, but this is the category that we, we put him in. Okay. Hedonistic. Here we are back to the Midwest. Um, so hedonistic serial killers and, and hedonism is really a term that means sins of the flesh. So, um, example here is from Milwaukee. So Jeffrey Dahmer, I'm sure you've probably heard of him. Um, he was a person who, um, you know, kept the dismembered body parts in his apartment. Um, he cannibalized some of his victims. What makes him hedonistic versus power oriented is his interest was not in torture and in keeping that victim alive. Okay. He killed them pretty quickly because his joy came from interacting with their bodies. Um, so, uh, you know, it, that's why we put him in not so much a power-oriented, but more of a hedonistic. Um, he is the one who, you know, he would pose his victims post-mortem, cannibalize them. Um, the interesting thing about Jeffrey Dahmer is, you know, neighbors knew about him um, or, you know, thought he was kind of, you know, the odd kid in the neighborhood 
very early on. And in fact, when investigators came to do uh, execute a search warrant on his parents' home, all of the neighbors came out and said, oh, you know, we knew something was wrong with Jeffrey. He was just a weird kid. He, um, you know, would, would neighborhood pets would disappear. He would take roadkill. And in fact, he put, um, you know, heads of animals on sticks in the backyard. And some of these neighbors even took pictures of it and showed them to the officers. But at no point did any one of those neighbors, when he was a small boy and doing this stuff, um, you know, ever go to the authorities and say, you know, I think we have a problem with Jeffrey. There's something wrong. So you wonder if early intervention had happened, you know, could these crimes have been avoided? And you can kind of see this in this picture where, you know, that's normally not the way you want to hold your, your tiny little kitten, you know, in a, in a chokehold. Okay, comfort serial killers. This is, this is an interesting case. First of all, they're female. They're partnered with each other. Um, and this is the rare serial killing where there's actually a motive. Okay, so this is um, Rolet and, Go uh, I'm sorry, Golay and Ruddersmith. And these were two little old ladies who lived out in San Francisco. And what they would do is they would, um, you know, look for homeless men that were, you know, alcoholic down on their luck and say, you know, why don't you come and live with us? We'll take care of you. You know, we'll give you nice hot meals and, you know, a place to stay. And then eventually they would have the these men sign an insurance policy, giving everything to them. And then it was time for Galay and Ruderschmidt to get rid of these men, normally by running them over with their car, um, placing, you know, a mangled bicycle by the body so that the police would assume, oh, this was just a horrific hit and run, but it's a homeless guy. What are we going to do? Um, they actually buried some of the bodies in their backyard. And actually, the, the first people who were onto them were um, investigators from the insurance companies. It was not the police. Um, and when they went to trial, I'm telling you, they almost got away with it because they came in just playing the, I'm just a little old lady, you know, I'm going to use my walker and, um, you know, uh, you know, walk with a cane and just look and dress like a little old grandma. And it's hard to look at that type of person and think, um, oh, okay, you're a serial killer. But, you know, as I've mentioned in class, a, a lot of times women are no less evil than men no less evil. They have that capacity as well. Okay. Uh, Charles Manson, um, who, um, with his family, which was basically, you know, a cult type arrangement, um, he was, uh, he, or he's labeled as a disciple type serial killer because he had, um, what he called his family and then he would direct them to commit homicide. So it was literally like a cult leader and then cult members. Um, so when you look at them, I mean, these gals look like more like college girls walking down, you know, a dorm room hallway than they do, um, you know, heartless serial killers. But, um, Charles Manson was very charismatic. He was able to get these people to do what he wanted to do. Um, on the right, lower right, we see Lynette Squeaky Fromm, who was a member of the family, was convicted and then released from prison, and then went out and attempted to assassinate then President Gerald Ford. So obviously, you know, she had some bigger issues. Um, Charles Manson was famous for having the swastika tattooed in the middle of his forehead. Um, interesting thing about him is he actually really wanted to be a musician and he was very good friends with um, Brian Wilson who it was um, you know the principal songwriter and member of the Beach Boys and when his music career didn't pan out well he's going to be famous one way or another so that's when he turned to you know kind of developing this cult and then um, you know ha having these killings uh, orchestrated. So when we talk about uncommon types of serial killers, um, like I'd mentioned, not a lot of females fit into this category. Um, probably the most famous is Eileen Warnos. So Eileen Warnos, and I actually feel sorry for Eileen, and I don't think it's because she's a woman. Um, I think it's because when you look at her history, she was literally sexually abused, mentally abused, physically abused from the minute she was born, basically. So had a horrible life. Um, and actually the first time she killed, if she had stopped then, 
um, it would have been labeled self-defense because it was one of her customers who attacked her in a very violent manner. And she ended up, I believe, shooting him. Um, and it was total self-defense. The problem was that then she continued and it was, uh, you know, men who literally would come to her and they just wanted sex. They just wanted to pay for sex and then go away. They weren't looking to hurt her physically, but she would kill them anyway and then rob them and take their belongings. Okay. So she, she took a turn where she did become, you know, a true killer where the, the victims weren't trying to, you know, attack her at all. And she was caught also by the fingerprint system, APHIS, um, when her print showed on a camera that she had pawned that belonged to one of the victims. She was executed in Florida. Okay, then we have partnered serial killers. Now remember the, the definition of a serial killer, it's normally one offender killing one victim and then separated by time, okay? However, we have seen instances um, where killers work in partners. And one prime example is Henry Lee, Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole. Um, so Otis Toole was the person um, who uh, has had claimed responsibility for killing Adam Walsh, John Walsh's son. We talked about that in class um, a little bit. Um, there's a really interesting movie, and I, you know, if you guys are bored during quarantine, um, maybe w try watching this. I believe it's on YouTube. Um, so Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer came out in God, I want to. It's early '90s, and I had read about it. And what made it controversial is when it came out. Um, the, the board that decides on the rating of the movie said that it had to be uh, rated X, which is obviously fits in with pornography. And the, the maker of the film said, are you, you know, are you crazy? There's no gratuitous sex. There's no nudity. How could you give this an X rating? And the reviewers said that, you know, basically the, the undercurrent or the tone of the film was so disturbing that they couldn't give it an R rating. And so they had to give it an X. And after battling, uh, you know, with the board, that's when the NC-17 rating um, came to be. And it was because of this film. Um, so that's kind of the in-between. You know, it's a little worse than, than an R rating, but it's not as bad as, you know, certainly hardcore pornography. Um, so, you know, I remember, you know, so of course, then I was like, oh my God, I got to watch it. And you know what? I did find it really disturbing. You know, there's a scene where Henry and Otis are brutalizing a family and, you know, there's no blood, there's no um, nudity or sexual content. Um, but the tone of it is just so, like, I remember just, I, just feeling sick. Um, now the, the special effects, super low tech. So you might watch this now and be like, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. Um, I'd be interested to know your thoughts in that. Um, uh, the other thing that's interesting, if you guys ever watch, uh, The Walking Dead. So the person in the movie who played Henry, and this was his first big, uh, role was Michael Rooker, who played, I think his name is Earl, was the, the character in The Walking Dead. But that's, that was his first big role. Um, I'd also mentioned the book Bringing Adam Home, which kind of is a, a great book for future law enforcement um, to read because it basically tells you everything that you shouldn't do in an investigation. Okay, here we are back to Canada. And this case kind of hits home for me because these homicides were occurring um, in Ontario while I was going to graduate school in Buffalo. And so it was only about an hour apart. And so we would get lots of local news coverage on, first of all, the missing girls. And then, you know, when the trial happened and, you know, it was so incredibly disturbing. I remember hearing news reports where, um, some members of the juries actually, you know, one person fainted, another one vomited when they were watching the videotapes that were made. So Paul, Paul Bernardo, was a bona fide sexual sadist, psychopathic individual. And um, he married um, a gal named Carla Homolka. Now, Carla <laughs> also had her own issues. So in fact, um, Paul had told her what he wanted for Christmas 
was to be able to rape her younger sister, who was, uh, I think, 17 at the time, um, because she was a virgin. He had a fetish for virgin and then um, also schoolgirls. And uh, like the great sister that she was, Carla said, okay, and I'll help you. And so they got her younger sister, Tammy, really drunk. They both had sex with her and videotaped the assaults. And then because they had given her um, too much alcohol mixed with sedative, Tammy ended up dying. So their first victim was actually Carla's little sister. Um, if you look at them, I mean, and, you know, granted their, you know, wedding was really garish and over the top, but a lot of 90s weddings were. Um, they looked normal. They looked like a, you know, the kind of stereotypical blonde um, young couple. And so they were um, called the Barbie and Ken killers. What's interesting about this case is, um, so what they would do is Carla um, would, they would approach, you know, a young girl walking along the side of the road. Carla would have a map with her because, okay, this is pre-GPS pre cell phones and ask for directions. And most people, when they see a female and especially, you know, kind of a slight in build female, they're not afraid of her. And so the girls would come close, try to help. And that's when Paul would sneak up behind them, um, incapacitate them and put them in the back of the car take them back to their home where they would be videotaped, being sexually assaulted, and then um, eventually murdered. Um, so uh, what was interesting is Carla Homolka played the, um, you know, beaten wife um, kind of syndrome that, you know, he abused me too. I didn't want to participate in any of this, but I was an abused wife. Um, you know, it was all about domestic violence. And so she was able to get a really great plea deal um, with the Crown Prosecution Service in, um, in Canada, serving, I want to say maybe 10 years. And after she had made that plea deal, she let the investigators know that, oh, by the way, um, we videotaped everything. And they're hidden up in a light fixture in our house. You might want to go take a, a look at those. And when the videotapes were viewed, it was very apparent that Carla was not some passive victim of Paul Bernardo. She was, in fact, um, you know, an equal participant at, at the least, and she actually suggested a lot of the acts that they committed in the videotape. Um, but they couldn't go back on the plea deal, so while Paul Bernardo is serving life in prison because they don't have the death penalty up in Canada, um, Carla Homolka got out of uh, prison and now she's happily living her life up in, I think, Montreal and, um, you know, remarried, has a couple of kids. And in my opinion, she was, she's every bit as psychopathic um, as Paul Bernardo was. I uh, just want to mention a couple. Okay, here we are back to the Midwest. Here is Ed Gein. So Ed Gein um, lived in Plainfield, Wisconsin, which is a, a small town. Um, he is actually the inspiration for, if you've seen um, Silence of the Lambs, the character Buffalo Bill, um, Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So Ed, um, Ed had some mommy issues, definitely. He had a very domineering mother. And um, he actually didn't start out as a killer. He was primarily um, a grave robber. And he, you know, he would have things made out of human skin in his house, um, he was making a woman's suit. Um, and so that's where, you know, the Buffalo Bill, um, inspiration comes from. He had accessories like a belt made of nipples, um, you know, but thus far he hadn't killed anyone. Um, his primary victim was the elderly female owner of the local drugstore, um, who he killed and then basically trussed her up like a deer, and the purpose was he wanted to har harvest her skin to make, um, you know, a suit of, of women. So um, interesting story about this. So I, I was on a, a, you know, on a road trip with a friend of mine and we happened to pass through Plainfield, Wisconsin. And I'm like, oh my God, this is, you know, where Ed Gein is from. So um, we stopped at a local um, kind of diner place and I was chatting with the owner of the diner and she told me, she goes, yeah, I was actually a teenager in town when all of that Ed Gein stuff was happening. And she said what was really interesting is everyone knew Ed Gein was the town crazy. You know, obviously, 
you know, people were furious at him for murdering one of their own, but they, they didn't necessarily want him, you know, executed. They just wanted him to go away, go away to a mental institution, which is, you know, actually what happened to him. Um, but one thing that the town did is um, someone in the entertainment industry had purchased the Gein farm after all of this happened um, with the intention of turning it into um, kind of a tourist attraction where people come in and see where, you know, Ed Gein lived and, and make a lot of money of this. Well, mysteriously, the Gein farm burned down in the middle of the night and lo and behold, the local Plainfield Volunteer Fire Department, gosh, they couldn't find their way to the farm. Where was it? Which is pretty amazing because um, this part of Wisconsin is really flat. So you're gonna be able to see a gigantic you know, farm on fire, but they just didn't get there in time, gosh darn it. And the uh, captain of the volunteer fire department at that time was the son of the victim from the drugstore. So it was basically the town banding together and saying, you know, we had this horrible tragedy, but you are not going to turn us into a tourist attraction. So we're just going to basically burn everything to the ground, which, you know, good for them. Okay, I'm gonna stop here because we're at 21 minutes. We have one more lecture chunk left and then we are done. Let me get this uploading. Thank you.